We're delighted that you're here with us. And we're glad that you're able to take some time from your busy schedules to be with us this afternoon to spend the next three or four hours to give you an update on ovarian cancer treatment and many of the exciting new developments that are happening in surgery, uh, drug discovery, new treatments, and how we're improving outcomes. We have a very exciting schedule planned with combination of surgery and new developments in chemotherapy and treatment. We're also having two separate sessions for questions and answers that hopefully we will be able to address a lot of the issues that come up. Um, it's very important for us if you give us feedback and there's a one minute survey in your packages, please help us fill this so we can improve this process and make sure that we're addressing your uh, questions and needs. Um, our first speaker, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Carol Long. She's one of our GYN oncology surgeons here. Um, she's going to discuss um, ovarian cancer screening and risk-reducing um, procedures. I know for a lot of you, as you go through this and go through uh, genetic testing, the next step is, is what, what about my daughters? What about my family members? Um, how does this affect them? And Kara's going to bring us up to date on that. Good morning. Thank you all for coming. It's wonderful to see so many faces in the crowd. Um, I am gonna talk about a topic near and dear to my heart, risk reducing surgery and screening advances. Um, I am one of the surgeons who takes care of women with all stages of ovarian cancer, but um, I also have a special interest in prevention and risk reduction. So just to start, um, some, very general, um, some very general facts about the disease. Um, we refer to ovarian cancer as sort of one disease, but it really is a combination of three separate diseases, cancer of the ovaries, cancer of the fallopian tubes, and cancer of the peritoneum, which is the lining of the abdominal compartment. So we'll say ovarian cancer, but we're really talking about sort of all of these three lumped together. What we think is that maybe all of these diseases start in the fallopian tube. Um, for years, we weren't aware of this, but as we've done more surgeries on women at high risk and learned more about the molecular basis of the disease, we're finding that there's good evidence, both circumstantial and very convincing, um, that it is, in fact, the fallopian tube. We found the precancerous lesion for high-grade serous ovarian cancer in the tube. In addition to gene expression profiles and continuity of TP53 mutations has led us to believe that maybe all of these cancers do start in the fallopian tube. That could explain one of the reasons why this disease spreads very early in the disease course. Um, as many of you know, unlike cancer of the cervix or cancer of the uterus, which most likely presents at an early stage, ovarian cancer is most likely diagnosed when it's already spread outside of the ovary and the pelvis itself. Most women come in with the disease at stage 3C or 4. This presents a problem for us because, um, as this graph depicts, um, women who are diagnosed with cancer um, in the early stages, which is represented by the top line, um, have much more favorable outcomes than women diagnosed with advanced stage disease, which is represented by the bottom two lines. There are still many women with stage 3C and 4 disease who are long-term survivors and have cures, but it is much easier to achieve those cures when women are diagnosed early. So this leads us to the big problem, and one of the reasons why I'm here today and why our teams are working towards um, better ways to find this disease early, as currently there is no effective strategy for ovarian cancer screening. We do not have a screening test. We've tried. Um, and there have been many, many studies, and, and this chart here depicts the results of several different studies, which all together enrolled more than 340,000 women, trying to see whether CA125s, transvaginal ultrasounds, and pelvic exams could find ovarian cancer at an earlier stage when it is at a more treatable um, you know, point in the disease course. And unfortunately, what all these studies showed was that women in the screening groups unfortunately died at the same rate as women in the routine care groups who did not get these screening tests. And so what that tells us um, is that um, we just don't have the screening test yet. And ACOG, which is the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, 
states that currently it appears the best way to detect early ovarian cancer is for both the patient and her clinician to have a high index of suspicion for the diagnosis in the symptomatic woman. There's many uh, organizations in this country that help us um, make screening guidelines, and I've listed a few of them here. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force um, has given ovarian cancer screening a D, which is obviously not what the grade that we want, um, and they in fact recommend against screening of asymptomatic, otherwise healthy women who are at normal risk. Well, that leads us to the next question is, what about women at high risk, women with family histories or genetic mutations? And for many years, we were offering screening to these women, and in some, in some situations, we still are. However, this time last year, the FDA released a statement recommending against using currently offered tests to screen for ovarian cancer for all women, including women at elevated risk. This was very difficult for us as clinicians because we want to do something. We want to screen these patients, but in fact, it just doesn't work. And the reasoning behind the FDA's statement was that they didn't want women to receive false reassurance with these screening tests. They didn't want women to think that because they'd had an ultrasound or a pelvic exam or a CA-125 that they were protected. They still wanted women to discuss with their doctor um, other ways to reduce their risk, which I'll talk about later on in my presentation. So that leaves us with these signs and symptoms, um, which I imagine everyone in this room is well aware of. Um, abdominal pain, bloating, um, difficulty eating or getting full quickly, pain during intercourse, changes in bowel function and urinary symptoms. And as we all know, these are very vague symptoms. Um, many women have these um, without having a cancer diagnosis, so it can be very confusing for patients and doctors. Um, so that leads us to what we're doing here. Um, as researchers and scientists who take care of this disease, um, we're looking for better ways. And there's several questions that we need to ask in order to find a test to screen for ovarian cancer. Um, we need to know what to look for, we need to know how to look for it, and we need to know where to look for it. And of course, will these things keep women healthy if we find a way to look for something? So one thing that is currently under development at Sloan Kettering um, and is, very, is a very exciting concept for us is the concept of using circulating tumor DNA or ctDNA. Um, and this concept relies upon the fact that small tumors, even tumors that are too small for CT scans or blood tests, to, um, other routine blood tests to find, release small fragments of their DNA into the patient's bloodstream um, as the tumor grows and potentially dies and sheds cells. If we can identify these tiny fragments of DNA um, in the same way that now pregnant women are offered early blood tests to determine the gender and the health of the fetus um, using the same kind of technology, we can find these tiny fragments of DNA in patients' blood screens, bloodstreams and potentially find cancers at an earlier stage before they could be picked up otherwise. Uh, this could also potentially be used to monitor patients um, as they're being treated to see whether the disease is responding um, and, of course, monitor them once they're in the surveillance phase. Uh, we're not there yet with it, but we are working on it and it's quite exciting. Another question is, are we looking in the right place? Um, traditionally, we've used uh, imaging as well as blood tests. Um, but given the fact that uh, these cancers probably all start in the fallopian tube, um, we've thought that maybe there's a way in via a pelvic exam that we could get to a sample that we could test. So we're looking at uterine washings or uterine lavages to try to quantify DNA and ovarian cancer biomarkers to see whether we could find evidence of early cancer um, before it even gets into the bloodstream. Preliminary work from our institution has shown that in these uterine washings or uterine lavages, we can find biomarkers for ovarian cancer, like CA125, HE4, YKL40, and mesothelian. And these markers are elevated in women with ovarian cancer. So currently, we're evaluating this novel approach to screening. And our hypothesis is that women with ovarian cancer um, and hopefully even women with very, over, very early ovarian cancer, that we will be able to find elevated biomarkers and elevated fragments of this abnormal DNA. 
The big picture is, of course, to advance ovarian cancer screening and take these technologies and incorporate them into screening tests that could be used in the clinic, maybe even biomedical devices that could be implanted to monitor cancer-related molecules and proteins. Early detection is key to uh, curing and taking care of this disease. However, prevention would be even better, keeping women from getting the disease altogether. In order to prevent the disease, women need to know their risk for the disease. Um, Angelina Jolie was very brave and came forward um, with her own uh, story with a genetic mutation. Um, and what we know is that family history of cancer, specifically ovarian, breast, uterine, or colon, may indicate a genetic predisposition that runs in the family. These are just a few of the genes of interest that we look for when evaluating patients, BRCA1, BRCA2, BRIP1, RAD51C, and D as well as the Lynch syndrome proteins. And we do recommend that the starting point for all testing be any patient or person in the family who's been affected by cancer. And we call this cascade testing. If we test the person in the family who has the cancer, we can find the most important mutation and then go forward and test any blood relatives who may be interested in finding out their risk. But unfortunately, the data suggests that only about 20% of women with ovarian cancer are actually being referred for genetic testing, even in some academic centers. So I think the first step is to encourage all women who are affected with this, this disease to undergo genetic testing. We do know that there are a lot of different genetic drivers for ovarian cancer. Some of them are inherited, and some of them do crop up spontaneously. And about 20% of ovarian cancer is thought to be related to them. If we identified every woman with a mutation, we could prevent at least 4,000 of the 21,000 new cases in the United States every year. How do we prevent those cases? Well, the standard way, the way that is proven the most effective, is to do a procedure called a risk-reducing salpingo-oophorectomy, which is removing the fallopian tubes and ovaries. This can be done with small incisions or a minimally invasive approach, and should be done by a surgeon experienced in the procedures. In addition to the surgeon, the unsung heroes of all of our cases are the pathologists, and they're very important in this too, because they process the fallopian tubes in a very special way to look for precancerous lesions and potentially early microscopic cancers. That, that methodology is called CFIM. We have good data that shows that removing the ovaries and the fallopian tubes in women with BRCA mutations keeps them healthy. There's a 75% decrease in the risk of developing a new gynecologic or breast cancer, and that risk is about a 90% decrease for ovarian and fallopian tube cancer. There is definitely a decrease in the risk of breast cancer, however, it's unclear the magnitude. Earlier data may be overestimated that risk, and so we're working to find that out. So to summarize some of the recommendations, women with a BRCA1 genetic mutation who are at the highest risk of developing an ovarian cancer are recommended to have their ovaries and their fallopian tubes removed between the ages of 35 and 40 because their risk of getting ovarian cancer goes up at an earlier age and is about 20% by the time they turn 50. BRCA2 mutation carriers are recommended to undergo the same risk-reducing salpingoophorectomy between the ages of 40 and 45, and their risk tends to go up during uh, the 50s. There are other genes as well, BRIP1, RAD51C, RAD51D, as well as some others that we're learning more about um, that we do think um, will also benefit from this surgery to remove the ovaries and the fallopian tubes. However, the data is not quite as strong because these are newer mutations. Um, we just don't have, we just haven't had the time to, to get that information yet. Um, so we are recommending that most women um, who have these mutations consider removing the ovaries and the fallopian tubes between ages 45 and 50. Family history should always be considered, even in the setting of patients with or without mutations. So removing the ovaries and the fallopian tubes is great, um, and we know it keeps women healthy. However, um, young women will be put into surgical menopause right away after the ovaries are removed. And we know that this can significantly affect a woman's quality of life, vaginal dryness, sexual function changes, sleep disturbances, and then overall health implications like bone health and heart health. And we know via studies that we've done that even women who understand the risks of their mutations will delay or refuse risk-reducing surgery altogether due to these quality of life concerns. 
So again, as researchers, we need to find a better way. Going back to the fallopian tube hypothesis, um, we realized that this might be an interesting opportunity to reduce risk without putting women into menopause. We know that the fallopian tube is related to the risk of ovarian cancer because women who have had their tubes tied or have had a tubal ligation have a decreased risk of getting the disease. We also know um, that in large populations, like a study out of Sweden which included over 5 million women and 30,000 cases of ovarian cancer, that removing at least one fallopian tube decreased the risk of getting the disease. So one uh, technique that we're currently studying here is called interval salpingectomy with delayed oophorectomy. And it's basically going in and removing a patient's fallopian tubes when she's done with childbearing or if she's planning IVF anytime, and then giving her a few more years with her ovaries and then having her come back at a later age um, hopefully the age that it's recommended, but in some women choose to defer even longer for removal of the ovaries. This is an alternative to screening alone, which we know doesn't work, in women who are high risk, who may not want to remove the ovaries. We know that patients and doctors want something better. Um, we've polled geneticists, genetic counselors, and gynecologic oncologists, and the vast majority agreed that trying this new technique, removing the tubes and then later removing the ovaries, um, was something that they were willing to try. And we absolutely know that patients are interested. In a study of um, patients with BRCA mutations, about a third of women were definitely interested in this approach, even if they knew it might not decrease their risk of cancer as much as removing the ovaries. And of course, um, the, the literature shows that the doctors are certainly excited about it because over the past few years, there have been numerous articles about salpingectomy or removal of the fallopian tubes um, and how it can be used to sort of advance the care of women at high risk. So here, um, we have a trial open for this. Um, it's called the WISP trial or Women Choosing Surgical Prevention. Um, and what this trial is, is women who are deemed high risk by their genetic mutation are counseled, they see a surgeon, and we discuss this trial with them and they can choose if they're appropriate candidates to go the standard route or go the route of interval removal of the fallopian tubes followed by definitive removal of the ovaries. And it's very exciting, we're finding that women are, are very eager to be a part of this. We also know that the fallopian tube might be an opportunity to keep women at average risk healthy. So ACOG um, released an opinion saying that women undergoing routine GYN surgery, like a hysterectomy for fibroids or something not cancer related, consider talking to their doctor about removing their fallopian tubes at the same time. Additionally, instead of tying the tubes, doctors should really consider removing the tubes. Um, it might be an opportunity to pre prevent women on a population level from getting this disease. So just to summarize, uh, the Society of Gynecological Oncology um, has recommendations to prevent ovarian cancer. Consider oral contraceptive pill use when appropriate, as we know that decreases the risk. Consider tubal sterilization, especially with removal of the tubes. Remove the ovaries and fallopian tubes in women at high risk. Counsel women and send them for genetic testing when appropriate and certainly consider removal of the fallopian tubes when childbearing is complete and women are having uh, surgery for other reasons. Uh, so in one year here at Sloan Kettering, we see over 200 women for risk-reducing surgery. Um, one of the reasons why this is near and dear to my heart is that in January, I was one of those women and uh, underwent my own risk-reducing surgery for a genetic mutation. Um, this is me leaving the hospital after my surgery. Um, I look very happy, which I think is because I had an excellent surgeon, um, but also because I knew I was getting this amazing opportunity um, to keep myself healthy. Um, and the reason why I have that opportunity is that um, 13 years ago, my mom was diagnosed with advanced, advanced ovarian cancer. Um, and over the course of the past few years, she underwent genetic testing um, to give myself and my siblings and our children the opportunity to stay healthy. Um, we're very lucky that my mom is well 13 years later um, and uh, is a force in the community, keeping, keeping us all aware of this disease and the risks. So that's her and my daughter there um, running an ovarian cancer race. So, uh, this is near and dear to my heart as a person, as a, as a daughter, and a mother, and a doctor, and a researcher. So I really I appreciate that you're all here. Um, thank you for coming. It's very important to us in the work we do.
Thank you so much, Kara, for this uh, outstanding overview and uh, summary. So um, we're going to have all the speakers finish the uh, first part and then bring them up to the podium and then take your questions through the uh, Q&A. Uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit and uh, Dr. David Hyman, who is the uh, Chief and Director of Drug Development here at Sloan Kettering, will be uh, giving us an overview on the MSK impact testing in GYN cancers. We're very fortunate to still have David with us in the gynecology disease management team treating many of our patients and he's a dear colleague and friend and really an outstanding expert to give us this overview. David. Uh, thank you. It's really an honor to be here today. Obviously a tough act to follow, but I'll tell my own mom story, which is that uh, my mom is actually sitting right there. Um, and she knew she couldn't come here without me embarrassing her. Um, she's always giving me a hard time uh, that she can never attend any of my talks. So every couple of years when she gets an invitation in the, meal, in the, in the mail to a a GYN kind of symposium here at Memorial, she scans to see if my name is there and then she doesn't even ask permission before she RSVPs. So thank you, mom and dad. They've been tracking my progress on putting these slides together very carefully over the last week. Um, so what I really wanted to do is tell you a little bit about um, the work we've been doing in uh, genetic uh, testing of cancers. And actually, it, it it, it uh, picks up very uh, nicely on what uh, Dr. Long was just talking about. And I, I wanted to start here with an overview of, of where the field is now, and that's defined as, as kind of what is considered standard of care right now. And uh, I divide it into the, the top three diseases we see here, and um, what I'm pointing out here are um, increasingly in the treatment of cancer, some form of genetic information is required to guide prescribing behavior. And um, when I gave this a talk like this a couple years ago, this slide would have been blank because we would have actually had no drugs um, associated with um, genetic uh, test results in gynecologic cancers. But now we do, and in ovarian cancer we have a class of medicines called PARP inhibitors, which are oral chemotherapy pills that um, are shown really remarkable activity, um, approved for women with BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations, occurring either in an inherited fashion, which was Dr. Long was talking to you about, or actually arising in the tumors. These are not mutations that are inherited, but happen after birth and help a normal cell become a cancerous cell. And if a woman has uh, one of these two mutations, again, either in the tumor or inherited, they qualify for um, this therapy. And so it really is incumbent on us to test all of our patients now. In endometrial cancer, uh, we recently had a very exciting development led by one of the physicians here, Luis Diaz, with an immunotherapy medicine. This is a medicine that stimulates the immune system to fight the cancer instead of attacking the cancer directly. For a class of cancers called MSI high cancers, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but that's a genetic marker that can also be found and is um, not infrequently found in endometrial cancers. So um, I'll, I'll touch on that in a little bit. In cervical cancer, which is a disease um, uh, associated primarily with um, a viral infection, we don't have yet any therapies linked to genetic disorders, but we're working very, or genetic mutations, but we're working very hard on that currently. Um, in terms of, uh, this is really picking up on what Dr. Long was just telling you about, all the testing I'm talking about on this slide is, is testing the, uh, the tumor of the patient, not their normal genes. But actually, increasingly in the treatment of gynecologic cancers, it's also important that we look for inherited predispositions for cancer. And in ovarian cancer, actually, all women with ovarian cancer are now, um, are, are now candidates for testing for at least BRCA1 and 2, these two genes to determine if that is why they develop cancer. And when I started um, as a gynecologic medical oncologist here, it used to be only patients that had a family history or a personal history suggestive of this were tested. But now the medical community has seen the value in testing everybody, even in the absence of family history or personal history. And we actually do find many patients that bear these mutations, um, even when their family history wouldn't suggest that they do. Um, and some patients even now opt for more extended testing. Um, in endometrial cancer, 
Um, we have a testing strategy that's in evolution at Memorial. We screen every patient's tumor for a hint that there may be a genetic predisposition. And um, if there is, there's uh, further testing done. Um, but there's not an absolute consensus on how to do this outside of uh, Memorial. And I'm going to tell you what our actual approach is. But this is kind of, I think, the view of the broader medical community. So um, in the previous two slides, what I showed you is the way that we've historically thought about cancers, which is a cancer is an ovarian cancer, or it's an endometrial cancer, or it's a cervical cancer. And this is a diagnostic approach to cancers that really has to do with where they came from. But increasingly, we understand that simply knowing where a cancer came from doesn't tell you everything that you might need to know about that disease. And this is a different uh, way to think about cancer. So here I've shown you six um, fairly common cancers. Um, and the mutations that we um, see um, in, within these individual cancers. So to kind of take you through this, lung cancer is the best developed example of this, where it is no longer sufficient to say a patient has lung cancer. They may have a lung cancer that has a BRAF mutation or an ERB2 mutation. These are names of different genes. And these different, the reason it's important to make these finer diagnostic classifications, again, is that these are associated with specific therapy options for patients, often that are far more effective than just generic chemotherapy in some circumstances. What I've also highlighted here in these red circles is another feature when you start to do this type of analysis. And what you see here is three different diseases that, although they come from different parts of the body, can actually have an identical mutation. And that's a theme that we've seen where um, we can see common mutations across diseases that we would think have, have really no other obvious relationship to themselves. And so it asks the obvious question is whether these three different cancers, all having BRAF mutations, might be treated similarly. Um, and so that's really the concept of, of precision medicine, which is can we customize the therapy that we offer patients based on uh, understanding often at the kind of microscopic or even molecular level of what makes their individual cancer tick. Um, and really there are three steps to this. One is um, understanding what mutations are present in a tumor, and then um, pa matching patients to drugs that target those mutations, and then understanding whether that strategy is effective. And sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't. And that's a lot of the work that we've been doing here. So our testing strategy, the test that we have, is a test that was developed at Memorial, and it's called MSK Impact. And this is a test, and I want to take you through what this, the experience of a patient having this test is. Um, the first step is that because we are doing a genetic test, we, we need consent. This is not like ordering a blood count or ordering, um, you know, looking at somebody's liver or kidney function. This is a test that involves sequencing of their genes. Um, and so we, we get consent from all our patients and we actually get consent on a research protocol so that we can learn perspectively from this experience and feed it back into the medical community. And so patients sign consent, and this consent um, may involve uh, watching actually a brief video, um, which some people in the room may have even seen, um, that explains um, what the testing is about and asking whether you would like to have um, an analysis of inherited, uh, I don't know what that is, risk factors for cancer. And then what would happen next is we would draw a tube of blood when you have a normal blood draw. So we don't need to do a special blood draw, but just the next time the patient's blood is drawn. And we would take a sample of their tumor. And what's nice about this test is that we can use any, pretty much any sample. So if you've had surgery any time in the past, we can use a piece of that material. We don't need to do a specific surgery. It doesn't need to be captured in any special way. Um, and even patients that have had surgery many years ago, that, that tumor is sitting somewhere um, in a repository and can usually be accessed by us. Um, and then we go through a, 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 a process by which the tumor and the blood are digested and they're subjected to these probes and they go on a big sequencing machine and then we generate data. And actually what's really remarkable is that in just one patient, um, worth of sequencing, it's actually about 15 gigabytes of data, which is larger than the first iPhone um, would have been able to store for just a single report. And all that information goes actually through a, a, a high performance computing cluster to analyze it and generate a, a, a 
couple page report, sometimes as short as a single page, that you and your physician can read. So it, you can see the kind of complexity, but all of this happens in a time frame of about three to four weeks. Um, now, there's two different types of reports that um, a patient that undergoes this type of testing might receive. Um, as I said, um, we actually look at the genes in both your tumor and your normal DNA, and we get your normal DNA by that sample of blood. And by doing both of those, we can see which mutations have arisen in the tumor after birth, and we think that those mutations are ones that are often potentially the more important mutations um, for your cancer and, and maybe more opportunity to treat based on. And we call those tumor mutations or non-inherited mutations. But as we've alluded to already, um, patients also, this type of testing may also re uh, identify inherited risk factors for cancer or even explain why somebody developed the cancer they have. And we view that as important. And in fact, when we look at um, our experience here, not even just in gynecologic cancers, but across the entire institution, we estimate that between 10 and 15 percent of patients um, seen here at Memorial that undergo this type of testing will have some form of inherited um, uh, genetic disease, essentially, that puts them at, them at increased risk for cancer. And so increasingly, patients are consenting to this um, analysis of inherited genes, and we look for all the genes that are associated with the development of gynecologic cancers, and I've listed some of the genes or syndromes here, but in fact, we look at about 78 different genes, so it's a quite large um, panel, and it, it really teaches us a lot about why patients develop cancer. So. Um, when I was a fellow um, training here in oncology, um, this was a clinical trial that was being conducted. I remember patients enrolling on it, and I wanted to give you a perspective by starting there to kind of give you a sense of how we're approaching um, treating patients based on these results, because kind of in, inherent in this entire discussion is that if we're going to offer this type of testing to patients and, and generate this genetic information, both on inherited and non-inherited, uh, mutations, it's really incumbent upon us to be able to offer treatment if we find something that might be um, important for the patient. And if it's something that's associated with an approved therapy, that's as easy as Dr. Agajanian writing a prescription for you. But if it's not associated with approved therapy, then we're really in the land of clinical trials, and we need to make sure that we have the clinical trials for our patients. So this is how these clinical trials used to be done. You would start with a tumor. Um, in this case, I'm showing you a picture of a melanoma, and you would test for an, one individual mutation on a test. And again, I'm re returning to that gene called BRAF, and the reason I'm doing that is that in melanoma, about half of patients with melanoma will have this BRAF mutation and half won't. So their tumor would be sent to the company, it would be tested, they would get a report back within a couple weeks saying it was positive, you can go on the clinical trial, or it's negative. If it was negative, there was no further treatment offered through that clinical trial. There may be standard treatments offered to that patient. And then if the mutation is present, the patient might be randomized even to receive standard of care chemotherapy versus a, a, a drug that targets that mutation. And this approach has actually been very successful in bringing new important treatments to patients. Um, the problem is, is that in melanoma, this worked because the BRF mutation was present 50% of the time. But in the cancers that we treat as gynecologic oncologists, the mutations are often present much more infrequently for any given gene. And it becomes inc incredibly hard to have a clinical trial for every single mutation for every single gynecologic cancer. So one of the ways that we have been able to address that is through this type of study that we call a basket study. And essentially what we've been doing there is opening up studies where patients that have a given mutation detected in their tumor or even might be in their inherited DNA are eligible to be treated on this clinical trial regardless of what kind of cancer they have. And that's actually been incredibly valuable to patients with less common or less, uh, with less common diseases where it might be harder to get companies to agree to open up studies specifically for endometrial or ovarian or cervical cancer, for example. And what I want to do now is show you some of the early results from these studies to give you a sense of where the field is moving and how uh, the things that you might encounter um, at Memorial. Um, one of the things, um, before I do that, that um, we also have thought a lot about is making sure that as we generate all of this information, 
that we don't miss the opportunity to act on something that's there because this field is moving so fast that when we began this work, the list of mutations that we had drugs for was comparatively smaller, and now it's much, much larger. And we've had situations where patients uh, may have had a test even a couple of years ago, and we're told at the time, well, there's nothing that we can act on in this test. And now a couple of years later, there's a new drug, a new clinical trial that opens, and we want to make sure that we're not forgetting about those patients. And so one of the really great things about having this test developed at Memorial is that all the results of that test are entered into protected databases, and they can be searched in a, in a way that maintains patient privacy um, for mutations that qualify patients for studies, and we can notify physicians in real time as new studies open. So when we open a study, we don't just look for patients that we identify with that mutation from that point on. We go back into the 20,000 patients that we've already sequenced and look for opportunities for those previously sequenced patients. Um, and we notify the physicians, um, and we might even prompt them when things happen. So for example, if we notice in the system that a patient's CA125 is rising, they will get an email saying, your patient that has mutation X that qualifies for this clinical trial, we've noticed that their CA125, their tumor marker has been rising. And so if you think it's appropriate, you know, we'd be happy to treat that patient. And that, this has really helped us avoid missed opportunities for patients. So this was um, the, the first one of these studies that we did. Um, and I'm just giving you a taste of the data, but I just want to orient you because I'm going to show you a couple of these slides. And um, what, we, what these slides show is every, every patient is a bar, and bars that are below the line is the percent that their tumor shrank, and if the bar is above the line, it's the percent that their tumor grew. And you can kind of see right off the bat, this was a, a, looking at a medicine that inhibits that BRAF gene that I said is mutated in about half a melanoma. And we looked at it in a bunch of other diseases, including lung cancer and a rare set of blood cancers. And just take a moment, although I know this is not a gynecologic cancer, to, to just emphasize how great these studies can be for orphan diseases like ovarian cancer. These set of rare blood disorders were actually a much, an order of magnitude rarer than ovarian cancer, and there had actually been no clinical trials ever conducted in this cancer. There was no approved therapies, and we actually were able to enroll a lot of these patients, and actually the FDA is on the verge of approving this drug for these patients based on this clinical trial. Um, this year they'll approve it. So that was very exciting. You can see how these studies can actually advance the standard of care for orphan diseases. In fact, you can see right here, we treated a woman with ovarian cancer, and you can see that she had um, a 60% regression in her tumor. And this actually, I know this patient uh, lasted um, for almost two years she was on this medicine. So that was very successful for her. And you could just appreciate that uh, you see a, rare, a range of cancers here, and we, we never really had conducted clinical trials like this before where there was such a diversity of cancer types um, enrolling. Um, I also draw your attention to this patient over here with a glioma, which is the same type of uh, brain cancer that, um, that John McCain has been diagnosed with. And that actually is this patient here, and she's um, obviously given us permission to talk to you about it. Her name is Marianne Anselmo, and she was actually featured on the cover of Time Magazine talking about um, closing this gap of centers that do this type of sequencing. She actually had that BRAF mutation detected in her tumor, um, and she came on our study. This is actually her scan um, showing her tumor over here and then going away two years later. And actually, I saw her last week in clinic. Uh, she's four and a half years into her diagnosis with um, with a with the malignant glioma, glioblastoma. And she's a jazz musician. She's gotten back to singing. Um, this was another study that we did, and I, I, I just um, were in the, in the midst of reporting now, um, where we targeted another mutation called HER2 with a, a drug. And again, you're now f experts at interpreting these complex plots, but every one of these bars is a patient. And what I want to um, emphasize here is, you can see here, cervical cancer. Cervical cancer is a difficult disease to do research in, obviously very rare. But actually, the majority of women with cervical cancer responded to this therapy, whereas with endometrial cancer, we actually had less success. And I think one of the uh, messages here is that we, in many cases, we can't consider um, all uh, 
all tumors to act the same, even if they have the same mutation. And that's why it's really important that we do these studies and determine what works and what doesn't work. And this is a woman with breast cancer with one of these mutations, um, you know, a woman that otherwise would have only gotten chemotherapy for her disease. And you can see all the bright spots and black spots here are her cancer. And this is uh, seven, week, er, seven weeks into therapy, kind of like turning off the light switch, and she stayed on treatment for um, almost a year and a half. This was a, a, just give you a couple more anecdotes and then um, uh, end and happy to take your questions after everyone goes and we have our discussion. But this is another um, uh, example that we recently presented at the annual cancer meeting, looking at another set of mutations called track fusions. And these are really incredible because they occur in an unbelievable diversity of cancer types. And what makes them kind of even more special to me is they not only occur in adult cancers, but they occur in pediatric cancers. And so we had the opportunity to treat not just adults on this clinical trial, but kids as young as several months old um, on this study. And I also want to highlight another feature I've been talking about, which is these red cancers. So these are very rare cancers where this mutation occurs very commonly. And so um, again, showing that we can really, this is a good way to a treating orphan diseases. And what we found is um, every one of these different bar colors is a different type of cancer. And you can see that the majority of patients responded, and there was no impact in this case in the type of cancer they had with what their outcome was likely to be. Uh, and many of these, again, were actually children. In fact, these two um, with these uh, asterisks over here are really special stories. These are two children with sarcomas who had a large sarcoma on their, um, on their legs that would have required amputation. Um, and they actually got this medicine. The tumor shrank down almost to nothing. They had a, a minor surgery um, that left them with no disability. In fact, at the time of surgery, there was no cancer left in the, in the surgical specimen. And these children both are off medicine and actually uh, living normal lives now. So even an opportunity to sometimes introduce these therapies earlier. I think I'm going to end on this slide. Um, or one more after this to summarize, but this is something that is immediately relevant to gynecologic cancers, and I alluded to this earlier. We know that, um, that uh, cancers, in particular colon and endometrial cancers, can develop not just a single mutation, but a pattern of mutations, or DNA damage, that's referred to as microsatellite instability. And this is something we can test through the same test, the same MSK impact test, and when we find it, it actually now allows us to prescribe this immunotherapy medicine where about half, to about 60% of the patients who receive this medicine um, will have dramatic responses, many of which will be um, long-term responses. And um, I have actually many patients in my practice who are receiving um, these medicines, some of whom have actually come off of the medicine um, with no uh, further evidence of, of progression of their cancers. So to kind of summarize, this is where we um, feel we are now as a field at Memorial, um, which is that this type of testing um, uh, for tumor and inherited mutations is really considered standard for all ovarian and endometrial cancer patients. Um, I, I don't know that everybody would agree with that outside of Memorial, but certainly that's the approach that we've taken. Um, we consider this testing investigational for some of our other diseases like cervical cancer, and um, we support that testing um, through uh, phil philanthropy and grants and a variety of other um, ways because we think it's important to be able to offer this testing to patients even if, if it's not considered a so-called billable test. Um, and for all of our patients, the results of this testing um, is used whenever possible to guide prescribing of both approved agents, so agents that have been approved by the FDA for the use, um, and also experimental treatments through um, our clinical trials. And uh, really, I just want to say uh, thank you again for all your support of um, this community. And really, I'm presenting on behalf of a of, of much, much, much larger team that actually do all this work. So thank you. Thank you so much, David, for this outstanding and really uh, amazing uh, presentation on the future and hope and research and development. So our next speaker is Dr. Oliver Zivanovic. Oliver is uh, my colleague and friend. He's part of the uh, team ovary of surgeons that we have at MSKCC. Ali, uh, originally from Germany, trained in Germany, 
then came and did an international fellowship with us here, went back to Germany for a couple of years, and now has been back with us for more than five years. Uh, one of the uh, very active members on Team Ovary for Advanced Ovarian Cancer Surgery. And he's going to give us an overview on the type of surgery needed when you have advanced ovarian cancer. Dr. Long talked about prevention and risk reduction. And now we're going to talk about how to manage when the disease happened and some of the innovation and developments that are happening with surgery to make life better for patients. Thank you, Ali. Thank you very much. I thank uh, the audience for coming, especially because I know there's, um, there are patients uh, and family members who had to face the diagnosis and go through uh, lots of complex treatments. And um, my goal is today to talk about the surgical side of ovarian cancer. And um, I have to be um, a little bit realistic about uh, the status quo ovarian cancer, unlike other cancers, is a rare disease, so the ad advancements in, um, in survival benefit are lagging behind uh, uh, when compared to other solid tumors that are much more um, commonly seen, and this is in times when uh, the budget for funding is going down and is uh, probably going to go down more in the future. So. Uh, we rely on advances and uh, philanthropy and um, support from industry, which is particularly difficult for surgical trials because no uh, pharmaceutical company is interested in surgery. Um, but I want to show you uh, the reality of what we're facing on a day-to-day -day basis um, here at MSKCC when we see patients who present here with ovarian cancer. Uh, as uh, Dr. Long pointed out, there is no screening test. So uh, ovarian cancer starts as a single cell in the fallopian tube. Fallopian tube is open to the abdominal cavity. Then little cells spread out to the peritoneal cavity. That's um, the lining of the abdomen. And uh, when we see patients most of the times in the OR, and I apologize, it has to be a little bit graphic here. Uh, I'm going to show you. Uh, a little clip. Uh, this is the abdominal cavity. This is the bowel. This is the uterus. Somewhere hidden behind is the ovary. But you can see all those thousands of white nodules. Um, these are cancer tumors spread throughout the peritoneal cavity. And you can see that they're very small, so they don't cause pain um, for, for a long time. And this is what we see on a daily basis. Uh, this is uh, another patient with a uh, loops of bowel covered with uh, cancer. All these white little dots, very small millimeters in size, um, are ovarian cancer. So for the longest time, when I was a resident, uh, we learned that ovarian cancer is non-curable and that uh, uh, patients who present with advanced disease are going to die within a year. This has fortunately changed, and in my talk I'm going to uh, be very optimistic even for patients who present with um, advanced stage disease. We know that uh, tumor biology plays a big role, age, we know tumor markers, uh, molecular markers, uh, but, but I want to focus on surgery because uh, sometimes the awareness for surgery is uh, underappreciated and um, the surgical effort cannot be measured very well, um, although we know that the better we are in the OR as an institution, as a cancer center, the more tumor we can remove, the higher the overall survival or the median life expectancies of those patients. Even if that means that we have to spend six, eight, or ten hours removing each of those little nodules. Um, but um, as long as the institutions and the leadership understands that time is of the essence, that we have to have the time to do our procedures, we can improve and advance things. And this is from our institution. Um, we can see that if we can remove all visible disease, we can never remove all disease. We always leave microscopic cells behind. But if we can remove all visible disease, the life expectancy of patients um, after surgery and then chemotherapy is the best. If we're not able to do this, then we're objecting the patients to surgery, hour-long surgery, with no survival benefits. So the goal has to be either
get all visible disease out or most of it and um, if you cannot do it uh, treat with uh, chemotherapy first and I'm going to talk to you about this a little bit later. This is a classical specimen uh, one of many that we removed. This is the right diaphragm with multiple hundreds of thousands uh, of tumors and we're able nowadays to do this. This is um, we're, we're uh, removing lymph nodes from the chest. This is actually the, the lung, and, and you can see the heart beating here is the lymph node. So we've done uh, many, many um, things in the past 20 years. We've improved our expertise in the OR, and we have improved uh, the outcomes of patients um, over 20 years by being able to remove more disease and leaving more disease, uh, uh, leaving more patients uh, with only microscopic disease. CGR stands for complete gross resection of all visible tumors. Um, in 2013, we had a, a CGR rate of almost 50%. Please keep that number in mind. And the median life expectancy of patients with stage three and four disease, those patients that I just saw you in the clip with multiple tumors, is um, the, on median 72 months. So over over five, six years, and we're counting. This is the newest um, analysis from our institution. If you're able to remove all visible disease, the median life expectancy is uh, seven, seven years. But there is a price the patients are paying. The OR time, on average, is six hours. Kara ye yesterday left the OR at about midnight, and, um, and it's not easy on the patients and the families. Uh, the hospital stays five, seven, ten days. Um, many patients experience uh, complications that need to be treated, and mortality is about one to two percent. So not um, everybody is uh, doing well. Why don't we give everybody chemotherapy first and shrink the disease, and then uh, do surgery in a setting where we don't have to be as aggressive. And this has been a trial pu published two years ago in The Lancet um, that has looked at this. And you can see that uh, patients in this trial were randomized to either go to the OR first with a goal to remove all visible disease followed by six cycles of standard chemotherapy or start with chemotherapy first uh, to downstage the disease, de decrease the amount of disease, then go to the OR after three cycles and after surgery uh, complete another three cycles. And um, when you look at the survival curves of both arms, patients did the same. But um, this, the complications in those patients who started with chemotherapy first were much less because surgery was much less uh, invasive. But I urge you to look at the um, overall survival here. Uh, in this study. It's not even two years in both arms. Um, and when compared to our data where I showed you a uh, median life expectancy of seven years and counting, this is not matching. And when you look at the complete gross resection rates in these trials, it's three trials, um, in only 18, 17, or 12 percent of um, patients uh, where the surgeons are able to remove all visible disease. And the OR time on average reported only in one study on average is only two hours. This is not what we are doing. This is completely um, a different approach to this disease. And um, those data have to be uh, realized. But despite that, um, the um, rates of surgery first in the United States and worldwide are trending down because of these trials, because it's easier to take care of a patient whose surgery was not as invasive. You spend less time in the OR, you have less complications. Um, the hospitals like, like that. So the trend is that uh, the role of surgery is going down, and that al although we, we see uh, improved survival rates in uh, centers who are um, performing uh, these surgeries on a much more frequent basis. So we realize that not every patient is suitable for a big surgery, and we're trying to uh, target this. We've set together with our radiologists, we've looked at, at many hundreds of CT scans. Uh, we've looked at 
um, age and the tumor markers, and we came up with a score sheet. Every patient who comes into our institution with an initial diagnosis of ovarian cancer uh, uh, will have uh, a CT scan, and the CT scan is going to um, result in a score. This score is going to predict as to whether a patient is at high risk of having a complete surgery or not, and, and, and we can triage a little bit better. And I'm just um, showing you uh, our latest results of those who scored low to 80 percent leave the OR with no, no uh, gross residual disease. And even in the high risk group, 52 percent of patients leave the OR with a complete gross resection rate. We need to uh, invest more in this. This is not a pharmaceutical question, but it's an important question for, for us and our fellows that we train in doing these long, long procedures. And we're um, about to um, launch this study that's going to look at who are the patients who uh, benefit from uh, surgery, who are the patients who are benefit from, from neoadjuvant chemotherapy. We need funding for this. Um, it's a crucial study for, for, for surgery. We're looking also at decreasing our um, complication rates from our big surgeries. Um, three years ago, under the leadership of uh, Nadim, we have started a, um, a program to reduce surgical site infections, which is a big problem for these big procedures. Um, now patients are coming through our doors, preparing for the surgery with oral antibiotics and a special soap to use the day before surgery in the OR. Not only are we changing our gloves multiple times, we're uh, changing the whole tray of surgical instruments uh, towards the end of the procedure. And when the patients go home, they get uh, instructions how to deal with the um, wound. And this has uh, resulted very quickly in a decrease in surgical site infections dramatically across all um, uh, sta stages, even in the elderly, even in patients who had long procedures, bowel resections, etc. We're also using new inno innovative um, techniques in the OR. This is um, me holding a camera um, and looking at um, a um, um, abdomen. We're looking um, at how healthy the tissue is that we are reconstructing because the reconstructive part of the surgery is um, very important. Um, and, we're, and we're injecting a dye intravenously and we can look if the tissue that we leave behind is healthy. And this is just a, um, a colonoscopy um, where we are injecting the dye. You can see that this colon has been divided and put back together. Uh, this is a very crucial part of the surgery. This connection needs to heal if this doesn't heal. Patients have infections and you can see this dye is green, how it um, is seen in both uh, parts of, the, uh, uh, of this colon and it's very, very um, healthy so you, you're certain that this is going to work. This is just a, um, another example of a, a dye that is not, um, that shows that there's a portion of this bowel that is not very well perfused, it's not healthy so you can change your practice in the OR and make the right decisions, and this is going to lead to uh, less abscesses, less um, unnecessary um, ileostomies, and less post-operative complications. Another initiative that we're doing at MSKCC is that we're giving chemotherapy under, um, in the OR under anesthesia. This is obviously an experimental design. It's far away from being standard, but you can see here how um, uh, there is a um, machine that's heating up the chemotherapy. The chemotherapy is being pushed into the patient and back. Um, this is a patient who had ovarian cancer uh, recurrence and then was treated with this chemotherapy. We're doing this and we can see it in the tissue all these pink cells are uh, dead cancer cells where the, the, uh, where the chemotherapy um, has infiltrated into the tissue. Again, we're doing this here is a randomized trial, um, the very first randomized trial in the United States for patients with recurrent ovarian cancer. So far we have 60 patients um, and uh, it's counting. We have great results in terms of me measurements of chemotherapeutic agent in the peritoneal cavity in, in, the, in the bloodstream. We don't see lots of um, 
toxicity from this treatment. And we're planning to advance this in the future for other settings, for more rare forms of ovarian cancer, or maybe uh, in the frontline therapy. Another thing that we're looking at is imaging in the OR. Uh, we inject, um, this is a mouse model, it's not uh, ripe yet, yet for um, uh, a patient, but in the mouse with ovarian cancer, we're injecting little tiny nanoparticles that go into uh, the tumor with a special camera. We can illuminate those particles and we can actually see uh, cancer cells uh, uh, that we usually don't see with our eyes. We can see those with a, with a camera. This is going to advance our field in the OR even more. And um, this is from Kara's database. Um, we're seeing about 7,000 patients in, in two years. Uh, this is a screening of all those patients. You can see 3,000 walk through our door uh, with an ovarian complaint. Of those, 810 have actually confirmed ovarian cancer. We're a high volume cancer center and we rely on um, uh, the funds and, and, and the, the help. And we, we're able to um, accomplish a lot. Uh, we've accomplished a lot over the past 20 years, I think. Um, in terms of surgery, uh, we are looking um, at uh, this gentleman here who, uh, uh, this is a photo from the 80s from the National Geographic. This was the first heart transplant in Poland. And you can see this doctor after 22 hours, how concerned he is with his patient who, by the way, is still alive. The doctor has already passed away. Uh, this is. <laughs> Um, the resident and the fellow back there sleeping from this procedure. This picture reminds me often of Kara and myself sometimes. <laughs> uh, but uh, we love what we're doing because we believe that we're doing the right thing. And um, I think uh, the future is going to show uh, great promising new advances in the OR to reduce the burden of uh, um, toxicities from surgery and help patients in the future. Thank you very much. All right, so we're gonna really test your science skills now, okay? So I would like to introduce Dr. Dimitri Zamorin. Um, we're very fortunate to have Dimitri on our team. He's an MD, PhD, he's an immunologist, um, and he is devoting his career to focusing his knowledge in immunology to the care of women with ovarian cancer. Um, and he's going to give a presentation on um, where we stand um, with immunotherapy and ovarian cancer. All right. Uh, I hope everybody enjoyed the break. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you guys a brief introduction on what, what, is, what is cancer immunotherapy really means and then what does it really mean for patients with ovarian cancer and where we are. So um, I usually like to start uh, a talk with some sort of a picture and I, I thought I'd put on this picture of, uh, of Jenner. So, so this is Edward Jenner. He's considered to be the father of immunotherapy. Obviously, if somebody has a statue made for them, they, they did something important. Not always, but, uh, but, uh, but, but, but in, in this case, he did. So he, so he was the first person to, uh, to establish vaccination against smallpox. This was back in the 1700s. And, and, and hence, that's why we consider him a father of the modern day immunotherapy. And obviously, his vaccination worked so well that the smallpox was eradic eradicated uh, from, from the earth, except from the, some laboratories around the world. So we're hoping that uh, by uh, using similar techniques or, or, or much more advanced techniques in, in, in immunology will eventually be able to achieve that with cancer uh, too. So, uh, so, so what is cancer immunotherapy? So it stems from the fact that tumors are not just composed of cancer cells. So this is just a, a nice little cartoon that's depicting it. You can see that this is, you know, what, uh, if you can imagine this is cancer, what it looks like under the microscope. And you see this, a lot of these bad looking cancer cells around there, but they're not just cancer cells in a tumor. They're, tons of other cells. You know, they're, they're the blood vessels that supply the cancer, and there are a lot of different types of immune cells within the tumor. There are these cells called macrophages, there are cells known as T cells, and a, and a bunch of other cells. And so you can see that the tumors are very, very infiltrated with these other cell populations. And obviously, those are the immune cells that are somehow responding to the cancer. But we also know that despite having all of these uh, immune cells within the cancer, the cancers continue to grow. And, and the reason for that is that 
the majority of these immune cells are actually bad cells. So rather than fighting the cancer, they're actually kind of helping cancer grow. So understanding of how the, this interaction between these immune cells and, uh, and the cancer cells works allows us to design new drugs or perhaps uh, uh, or, or understand why certain patients respond to certain treatments and, and others do not. So, uh, so this is just a basic overview of what, uh, what, what the immune system means. And this is, uh, those are the different types of cells that are present within your immune system. We have this, what is known as an innate immune system. So this is the one that rapidly responds typically to any infections. And, uh, and, and a common cell that you could see here is uh, cells like macrophages or cells like neutrophils. Those are the things that we monitor in the patients when we give them chemotherapy because those cells are very important in fighting uh, bacterial infections. They're, they are the very early uh, response to any infection that may occur. And then there are these other cells that are, that are confined to this part of the immune system known as the adaptive immunity. So it's a, it's a very slow responding part of the immune system, but this is the part of the immune system that can actually learn. So for example, if you get a, if, if you get a viral infection, let's, let's say you get a flu infection, this is the part of the immune system that actually learns uh, and, and, rec and, and teaches itself to recognize that virus. So when, whenever you get a, a flu infection, you expand a, spe a special type of a cell known as a T cell, and, and that cell, once it learns to recognize that flu, next time you get a flu infection, it will be able to, to prevent it from coming. This is how the flu, the flu vaccines or any vaccines work. We teach this adaptive part of the immune system to recognize an infection. While this is also the part of the immune system that best recognizes cancer cells as well. So all of the immunotherapies that we use uh, against the cancer, they try to target this specific part of the immune system known as the T cell, okay? So if, uh, the most important thing from this slide, if you remember, is the T cells are good. And, and those are the ones that we're trying to, uh, to stimulate. So, so um, and we have data from, uh, from cancer patients showing that the T cells are good. So this is without any immunotherapy. If we take a patient with ovarian cancer and see whether they have T cells within the tumor, the patients that have the most T cells within the tumor tend to do better, meaning they live longer. They, tend, they, they even tend to respond to chemotherapies better now, many studies have shown. So this is just a study that was published now close to 15 years ago, demonstrating that a diagnosis, if somebody has more T cells within the tumor, those patients do better and live longer. So, so the goal of any sort of immunotherapy that we give is really to try to, to enhance the recognition of the tumor by these T cells. Uh, and in order to do that, the, the immune system needs to recognize the cancer as foreign, as a non-self, just kind of like a viral infection. So, so how does it do it? So, so now we'll go a little bit into the actual science of this, of uh, how, what, what, is a, what does the cancer do to the immune system to recognize it as non-self. So, um, so if you can imagine that those are cancer cells, um, uh, the cancer cells constantly get lysed, uh, either by dying or by, by, by us giving them chemotherapy or other treatments. And they release these uh, special little proteins called uh, antigens. So they're, they're known as tumor-associated antigens or tumor-specific antigens. So the, these proteins get picked up by immune system or by a specific type of cell known as antigen-presenting cell. And it, it processes them and, and, and carries them over to the T cells. Again, remember, the T cell is the most important cell here. And once the T cell learns, uh, you know, what is a foreign antigen, it gets activated, and then it goes back to the tumor and, and kills the cancer cells, okay? So that's, a, that's sort of a, the simplified mechanism of how it works. And then again, this T cell is now very specific for this cancer. So if this happened all the time, obviously none of us would ever get cancers. And the reason that, uh, that this doesn't always work is because there are a lot of other mechanisms that prevent these T cells from working uh, appropriately. So for example, there are special proteins on the surface of T cell known as uh, immune checkpoints. And they, and they sort of, they inhibit the T cells from uh, working appropriately. And they're, they're natural mechanisms that the body has evolved because we don't want the T cells to be proliferating uh, all the time in response to infection, for example. But, uh, but the cancer explores these proteins. So, uh, so these T cells actually express many of them. Uh, some of them uh, you may have heard on the news, they're known as PD-1 and CTLA-4. But what these proteins do, they prevent the T cells from working properly. And there are other cells within these tumors that can also block the function of these T cells. It could be the tumor cells themselves, that could be tumor, other, other type of cell within the tumor known as macrophages, 
and, and other basically constituents of, of this what we call a tumor environment or rather microenvironment. So uh, with, with understanding of how this works, we have been able to design some drugs that target different parts of this uh, immune response. So uh, one of the first drugs you may have heard is uh, tumor vaccines. So uh, how do tumor vaccines work? Well, we basically take these antigens, uh, those special tumor specific proteins, and we just give it back to the patient. And then, uh, and then uh, by, by doing this, we're hoping to, te uh, to teach the immune system to recognize, again, these uh, tumor specific antigens. So then the, uh, once we activate these T cells, they could react against the tumors. Obviously, that does not work very well by itself, at least so far, most of the vaccine studies that have been done in the field, unfortunately, have not been successful. And again, that's primarily because there are many other inhibitory mechanisms that are acting to prevent these T cells from working. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this is outlined here. Again, like I mentioned before, there are all of these proteins on the, on the surface of the T cells and on the surface of the tumors that, that prevent the T cells from working uh, appropriately. But now, some of the newer drugs that we have can actually block these proteins. If, uh, if you can imagine that a T cell is a car and these proteins are a brake on a car, uh, by, by using these new drugs, we're kind of removing the brakes from the car and allowing the car to function, okay? So, uh, so, uh, so this is an example of, of two drugs that have been approved uh, in metastatic melanoma. One is targeting a protein on the surface of T cell called CTLA-4. The other one is targeting a protein on the surface of T cell called PD-1. And then there's some other ones that target another protein on tumor cells called PDL one so uh, and both of these drugs have been approved in melanoma. You can see that the, this is the initial phase three trial that resulted uh, in approval of the drug called ipilimumab, uh, also known as Yervoy. That's for metastatic melanoma. Uh, this is a dr uh, trial that resulted in approval of another drug called nivolumab uh, for the treatment of metastatic melanoma as well. And these drugs are increasingly being used in other cancers too, and we know that they have activity. And here's a small trial of, uh, of, of this drug, nivolumab, that was done in, uh, in ovarian cancer too. And, and you can see that you know, some of these patients, I mean, if you, if, if you ever read these curves, basically if, we, if you see the graphs going down, that means the tumor is growing after you started the drug. If, the, if you see that the graphs are going up, that means uh, those are the patients in whom, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the, if the, the graphs are going down, that means the tumor is shrinking. If the, if, if the bars are going up, that means that the tumor is growing. And you can see that in this study, the majority of the patients had um, either stabilization of their tumors, so that it, it did not grow too much, or some of them actually had uh, the shrinkage. But you know, it's, it's only, in this case, it's four patients out of 20 that had the shrinkage. We would obviously like to have uh, this drug to be effective in more patients. So, uh, so this is where we go to, um, to combinations of the drugs. But just, just, so, just so you hear, what, what are some of these uh, used drugs um, that, that are currently on the market? So, so you can see that there's a drug called nivolumab and pembrolizumab, uh, uh, which are targeting this PD-1 molecule. They are currently approved for different cancers. Uh, there are some of these other drugs that are listed here as well. So none of them currently have been approved for ovarian cancer yet, but we're hoping that uh, you know, they, they will be approved within the next uh, few coming years. Uh, and then, uh, like I mentioned before, what, what we're trying to do now is to, to enhance the ability of these drugs so they can benefit more patients and hopefully be more applicable to, uh, to most of our ovarian cancer patients and not just um, you know, the minority of them. So uh, like I mentioned, there, uh, this is a T cell. There are many, many different targets on the surface of these T cells. Some of them stimulate the activation of T cells. Some of them inhibit them. So what we can do now is we can, we can pick and choose from some of these drugs on the left and on the right and combine them and see whether we can enhance the activation of these T cells and help them recognize the cancer. Uh, so this is a trial that was done, again, in metastatic melanoma, combining now two of these drugs. One, is, one of them is called nivolo, uh, nivolumab, the other one ipilimumab. Uh, comparing to the single drugs alone, you can, you can see that the combination seems to work better, at least in melanoma. So uh, what we're trying to understand now is uh, whether this could work better for ovarian cancer as well. We have this trial that's currently ongoing. Actually, it has already completed the accrual, so we're, we're hoping to get the results within the next few months. And, and what it basically does is that it takes this anti-PD-1 nivolumab drug and, uh, uh, or, combi or a combination of these drugs with ipilimumab in patients with ovarian cancer patients. So we will see whether this combination works better for ovarian cancer patients. 
uh, as well. Okay. Uh, naturally, we're trying to combine these drugs with, uh, with standard chemotherapies as well. As you know, that unfortunately, the number of patients that got cured with ovarian cancer has not changed uh, over the past 20 years, even though, even though the patients are living longer. So there are a few trials that are ongoing that are combining these standard chemotherapies with drugs like carboplatin, paclitaxel, and bevacizumab with some of these immune drugs. So uh, I, I have highlighted two trials that are ongoing at MSK right now, both in, a, in an upfront setting um, and also in a recurrent platinum resistant setting. And, and, uh, and there are quite a few others as well, not all of them uh, we have ongoing at, at MSKCC, but, uh, but, but they are ongoing around the country and around the world. So we're hoping that by, by incorporation of these drugs, even into the standard chemotherapy regimens, we'll be able to, first of all, enhance how the, uh, how the patients respond to them, but also to make them live longer. Uh, this is an example of a trial that actually combined uh, uh, one of these immunotherapy drugs called duralumab with, uh, with a PARP inhibitor, Olaparib, or with, uh, uh, with another targeted drug called sidiranib. And um, in this study, there, there were a few patients that had um, uh, decent responses, but again, this, this study was a little bit too small for us to draw any conclusions whether this is the, those are the combinations that are necessarily uh, going to be good for these patients. Uh, and then there are many other experimental things that we can do, and that some of which we are doing at the MSKCC. Uh, again, there are there are many ways that you can try to stimulate the immune system. Uh, one of it is through the use of various vaccines, and you can see that I mean I'm not going to go through every single one of them, but vaccines come in many different flavors. Sometimes we just give us a, a protein. Uh, sometimes we have a whole cancer cell. Sometimes we use a virus that's encoding a specific um, uh, antigen. Uh, we can also use uh, uh, standard treatments in combination with these immunotherapies. I have mentioned vaccines, but there are also other tumor targeting antibodies, uh, targeted therapies, such as the ones that Dr. Hyman has spoken about. And again, obviously, we're using them in combination with these drugs that are trying to activate the T cells, or, or at least to um, uh, targeting the molecules that prevent the T cells from working uh, appropriately. This is an example of such a study that uh, is about to start, finally, after a long time. This is a, a study that I'm leading, and this is going to be with, in patients with recurrent um, peritoneal cancer, such as ovarian cancer. They will receive intraperitoneal infusion of a, of a virus, actually. This is a virus that activates the immune system against the tumors in combination with one of these systemic uh, anti um, uh, pd one uh, agents. I would also like to, to give a brief mention of, of, of a part of the immunotherapy field known as adoptive T-cell uh, transfer. So, so what, what is done for these types of treatments is that um, uh, these T-cells are actually collected out of the patients. So basically patients undergo uh, kind of like a blood donation, and then we extract the T cells from the patients, we grow them up, and we genetically modify them to recognize specific tumor antigens, and then we give them back to the patients. So if you can imagine, we, we now have this immune system that we have expanded to recognize specifically some protein in the tumor, and we're putting them back with the hope that now, because we flood the tumor with these many tumor-specific T cells, uh, it, uh, they'll be able to recognize and kill these tumor cells. And, th and this proved to be very successful against some uh, leukemias and lymphomas. Uh, this has been shown to be successful in melanoma as well. So now we're hoping we'll be able to, de uh, to demonstrate this for ovarian cancer. Uh, this is the trial that's actually ongoing at, uh, at Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, with Dr. Roshin O'Carroll as a PI. Uh, and this one is using these genetically modified T cells that's um, uh, that are taught to recognize a specific protein on cancer cells known as MUC16. Uh, this is not patient data, this is mouse data, but it's really demonstrating you know, here that those CAR T cells can really you know, eliminate these tumors. So we're hoping that uh, uh, whatever has uh, been achieved in the mouse models will be possible in the patients as well. So, so that trial is ongoing, and, and these patients receive uh, both intravenous and intraperitoneal infusion of these, uh, again, T cells to, to, uh, with the hope that uh, it will be able to recognize and kill their cancers. Uh, I want to briefly mention the side effects from these therapies uh, because they're very different than the side effects you expect from uh, chemotherapies. In, in general, the side effects are much easier, uh, these drugs are much easier tolerated than chemotherapy. Patients don't lose their hair, with, with some exceptions. 
Uh, patients uh, don't, typically don't get nausea, they don't get vomiting, the blood counts do not go down. It's, um, some, I have had patients that complain that uh, they don't get any side effects and they're concerned that the treatment is not working, which is, <laughs> which, is, which, which is a nice thing to complain about, the first part, not the latter part, obviously. So, 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 but, 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 it, uh, but it doesn't seem that the side effects necessarily correlate with the efficacy of the treatments. But what the, when the patients do get the side effects is when this immune system or these immune cells that we are activating within them start recognizing not just the cancer cells but also the normal uh, tissues that you can have and can cause what, what is known as kind of like a mild version or sometimes a severe version of autoimmune disease. So, so the most common things we see is uh, patients can get a rash. Those things are very easy to manage. But, um, uh, but sometimes, um, you know, there are other things that can happen with other organs. So, so the things we do get concerned about is when the patients get inflammation in the colon, known as colitis, and this, this can actually mimic uh, the, uh, this sort of like autoimmune uh, col uh, colitis, kind of like uh, ulcerative colitis, or for example, Crohn's disease. Uh, it can cause uh, inflammation in the liver. It can cause inflammation in the lungs, known as pneumonitis. Uh, many patients get a thyroid dysfunction, which means that they need to go on a thyroid supplements. Again, this is, uh, so mo uh, most of the time, these effects are very easily manageable through the use of steroids, but it's, uh, it's something that we have to keep in mind all the time and have to monitor the patients closely uh, for these side effects. And that's where I'm going to stop. I'm just, this is probably my most important slide. I'm going to mention all of the people who are uh, working in this field. And, uh, you know, this is, this is our gynecologic medical oncologist service and the entire MSKCC GYN disease management team, um, uh, the funding agency, and most importantly, obviously, the patients that are, that are willing to participate, all you guys who, uh, who are the patients who are willing to participate in these studies and, and help us bring those uh, newer types of therapies. To you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Karen Kadu. Um, Karen um, serves two roles in our service. Um, she's a gynecologic medical oncologist, so taking care of patients alongside of us, but she's also our team expert. Um, in clinical genetics. Um, she does our clinical genetics um, counseling and testing um, for our gynecologic cancer patients. Um, she's going to discuss with us um, treatment with PARP inhibitors. Um, this is an interesting time for us. We used to do um, genetic testing, um, as you heard earlier this morning, to help those family members of our patients, but now um, genetic testing has evolved and in addition to that to being something that's guiding treatment for us. So, Dr. Could you? Thank you. One second. So, thank you very much everybody for sticking around to hear this last talk of the day. I'm sure you're all tired. Um, and uh, this is an exciting world as uh, Dr. Eugenia has said. Um, and it's a rapidly changing world as well and, you know, what we just heard about is the science of the future, but this is the science of right now. And we're very excited about where we've got to here. Um, and of course, we're hoping for more progress still into the future. So um, what we're talking about today is PARP and DNA damage repair. And I want to just take a moment to um, talk about what this really means and what the role of PARP is. And of course, it's very complicated and much more complicated than we're going to discuss today. But I just wanted to give you some orientation um, to uh, how the system works. And we experience DNA damage all the time. That's part of life. Um, and we have to have a process, or we have, I should say, a very um, exquisitely complex and, and um, finely tuned process by which we repair this DNA damage. So most times we have single strand breaks, and then PARP um, is involved in repairing these breaks. And it's pretty straightforward in that setting. If you inhibit PARP, however, um, what happens is that the process by which you usually repair those single strand breaks is um, not working properly. And so you um, get problems with DNA replication. And when the DNA is um, going down the process of replication, you get um, double strand break formation or stalling of the replication fork. And that's a bad thing. Uh, but luckily, the system has backup. And in a normal cell with a functioning homologous recombination pathway, it's able to get over this piece. 
However, of course, in cancer cells, we don't want it to get over this piece. We want damage. We want the cancer cell to be damaged. And this is what we exploit with PARP inhibitors. So where this world started was with BRCA deficient cells. So if you see there, if you have a BRCA deficient cell, um, well then it's not able to um, get over this um, double strand break or it uses alternative mechanisms of repair. And these are error prone, resulting in genomic instability and cell death. And so this is the um, mechanism by which we started to explore the work of PARP inhibitors, primarily in the setting of BRCA mutations. So what you've heard about already today, of course, is inherited genetics and the role um, of inherited genetics and the potential for pre cancer prevention. And what we're going to talk about this afternoon is a mix of inherited genetics and the tumor's genes as well, both of which are important in this world. Um, and mainly in the setting of inherited genetics, we are, of course, talking about BRCA1 and 2, which you've all heard about, um, but which you may, uh, I'm sorry, just to say what's the risk of ovarian cancer with the BRCA1 and 2 mutation, and Dr. Long may have covered this, but you know, it's about 20 to 40 percent lifetime risk. Um, but the genes that you may not be quite as familiar with or that we've sort of learned about more recently are what we call the moderate penetrance genes. And by that we mean the risk of cancer with these genes is not quite as high as it is with BRCA1 and 2. It is significantly higher than lifetime um, population risk, of course. So if you see there, the U.S. population risk of ovarian cancer is just above 1%. If you have a, an inherited mutation in one of these other genes, BRIP1, RAD51C, or RAD51D, your risk of ovarian cancer is up to about 14%. And these are inherited genes that are part of this homologous recombination pathway, which is why I'm bringing them into the mix here. So the question is if these, if patients who have these alterations in their genes may have um, the potential for their tumors to be more vulnerable to PARP inhibitors, then what, um, what number of our patients does this represent? Um, and their inherited mutations in the homologous recombination pathway, including BRCA1 and 2, which make up the majority, of course, um, it, it's about 20 percent. So about 20 percent of ovarian cancer patients will have one of these alterations. Um, I just gave you a little bit of a breakdown on, the, on your right. About two-thirds, of course, are BRCA1 and 2, and then BRIP1, RAD51C and D that I mentioned. And then some of these other genes are a little well, less well understood, or their links are less well understood, um, PALB2, um, BARD1, and there's some others that I haven't included here. So we reviewed at the beginning, if you block PARP function and you don't have a backup system, well then you get cell death. And this is of course the whole uh, mechanism of PARP inhibitors. But really um, this vulnerability extends, as I said, beyond inherited BRCA mutations. And we have this concept of BRCA nests. So um, there may be dysfunction in this pathway that may make the tumor vulnerable to a PARP inhibitor either because of tumor BRCA1 and 2 mutations, that's somatic mutations, or because of decreased expression of BRCA um, whereby it's not working properly, or by mutations in other pathway genes like BRIP1 or RAD51C and D that I mentioned. And those mutations we think of primarily as being inherited or germline, but the tumors can also have those mutations just the same way as they can have a BRCA mutation. And this may be important. Um, and so what proportion of patients might this apply to? Two, it's about 8% maybe. So between the um, inherited mutations and tumor mutations, we're now up to about 30% of patients with ovarian cancer. So uh, broadening our reach, hopefully, where we might get a response to PARP inhibitor therapy. And actually, when you look at high-grade serous cancers, the last slide was referring to a mix of ovarian cancers, but high-grade serous is the most common kind of ovarian cancer, um, and it's particularly dependent on this pathway for functioning. And um, in this study, this uh, fairly robust study, um, about 50% of high-grade serous cancers may have a vulnerability to um, these um, to targeting this pathway. Some of the mechanisms that are included in this 50% are not very well understood, and we don't know how important they are, but it just gives us a sort of an enthusiasm or a hope that there may be um, many people beyond those who have an inherited BRCA mutation who might experience benefit from these drugs. And this is part of what's led to the drug development and our, um, where we've got to today in terms of our approvals. 
So that's what we're going to focus on next. And just by way of orientation, I'm sure most people um, are familiar with this, but just I wanted to sort of be clear about some of the terms that we're going to use going forward. Um, so for um, people who have a relatively advanced, or advanced stage of ovarian cancer diagnosis, um, they have their upfront therapy, and then if they have recurrent disease, we classify this as platinum sensitive or platinum uh, resistant, as has been, I'm sure, expressed already today, but um, that we distinguish recurrent uh, disease based on the time from end of platinum therapy. And this term is important in, in the PARP inhibitor world and in the approvals of these drugs. So this is just a brief overview of what we're going to talk about. Um, so um, we have four approvals in ovarian cancer. Um, uh, two as treatment um, for disease present, uh, that's the top two, and then two as maintenance therapy after a platinum-based therapy for platinum-sensitive recurrent disease. Um, and these are the studies that left, led to the FDA approvals, and I'm just going to run through them um, today. So our first approval was in 2014, um, and it was Olaparib, and it was based on a study of patients who had an inherited BRCA mutation. And if we just pick out the ovarian cancer patients from the study, um, these patients had had a lot of prior therapy. Um, most of them had had more than three prior therapies. And as you can see, 30% had had six to 14 prior lines of therapy for their disease. So they'd had a lot of treatment. Um, and you know, this response rate was very exciting. In these patients who had had a lot of treatment, we got a response rate of 30%. Um, and so very promising. Um, with PARP inhibition. And as you can see on the right there, patients who had platinum sensitive recurrent disease had, uh, were more likely to have a response um, to PARP inhibitors. And this is what we would expect actually by the biology. Um, the progression free survival, that's the time from starting the PARP inhibitor to the next event or having to change treatment was seven months and overall survival 17 months. And again, this is, these are good numbers for um, this patient population where they'd had a lot of prior therapy. And so this was a, a, a great development. And for most patients, um, the Olaparib is, is reasonably well tolerated. Um, don't forget these are patients who have disease present. There's no placebo in this trial. And uh, whilst these drugs cause nausea and fatigue, so do the disease, of course, and anemia as well as a, a side effect, a more prominent side effect. Uh, and again, people have had a lot of prior chemotherapy and you know, anemia is a feature of that world too, of course. Um, but when we look at more serious or grade three side effects, um, these were relatively infrequent, um, uh, most of the side effects for people were tolerable. So this was our first PARP inhibitor approval in 2014 uh, for patients who had inherited BRCA mutation and three prior therapies based on this study. And then we had to wait a little while, 2016, late 2016, before we had more progress. Um, and that was the approval of Rucaparib, again, for treatment of ovarian cancer. And this was um, based on two clinical trials. Um, so um, the safety population was all patients who had received the drugs, um, but the efficacy population that the FDA focused on in terms of drug effect um, were looking at patients who'd had two prior therapies and had a BRCA mutation either in their genes or their tumor's genes. Um, and so just to point out the, that these patients in this clinical trial um, had had less prior therapy and were in general in better shape than in the Olaparib study that I just presented. So we look at the performance status, which is sort of a global measure of how well people are doing. And in the prior study, patients who had a performance status of two were allowed to enter. In this study, um, patients had to have a performance status of zero or one. So um, they were in better shape and had less prior therapy. And reflecting that, the response rate is higher in this study than it was in the Olaparib study. And as I said, this reflects the patient population rather than an issue necessarily with the drug. Um, but again, very excited about this response rate of 50% um, and a progression-free survival of 10 months. Um, and um, I haven't shown you, but similar to the other study, patients who had platinum-sensitive recurrent disease had a better response. And again, this is relatively well tolerated, nausea and fatigue, but often low grade. Um, some anemia, again, platelet problems. This drug does cause some liver function test abnormalities that were more problematic. Um, and um, they, we do know that PARP inhibitors can rarely cause uh, more serious side effects, um, like an acute leukemia, but less than 1% of patients in this study. 
So this is the basis for the FDA approval of Rucaparib, which is two or more prior therapies and um, an inherited or tumor BRCA mutation. But what about um, those patients who do not have a BRCA mutation? Um, so the Rucaparib study, Ariel 2, which was one part of that FDA approval, um, tried to understand um, what patients who did not have a BRCA mutation might be more likely to benefit from this drug, based partly on this idea that there, there may be vulnerabilities within tumors um, in this pathway that are not captured, that are captured by other mechanisms, I should say. And the idea was that they had a, uh, they separated out um, the patients who had a BRCA-associated tumor versus those who did not, um, and they separate out the um, BRCA wild type, that's no mutation tumors, into two groups. Those that had a BRCA-like genomic signature, so may behave in a similar way, and those that were not. And the idea was that the patients who had this high LOH um, at the cutoff of 14% is what they used based on um, prior study data, um, would get more benefit from PARP inhibitors than those um, that were low. And as I said, the idea was you could select out, hopefully, patients who are more likely to benefit from this drug that did not have a BRCA mutation. Um, and when they first presented this data in 2015, it looked somewhat promising. As you can see, um, the, it seemed to separate out, as you would expect, patients who had a BRCA mutation did better, those who had a BRCA-like associated tumor um, next, and then those who were biomarker negative um, unfortunately weren't benefiting, and that might, was sort of consistent with what you might expect. But when they published the data, ultimately, um, the um, biomarker was no longer separating out. And actually, um, when, there probably is more to this, but actually they um, did refine the signature and test it again in a further study, and unfortunately have not been able to separate out the patients who were more likely to benefit versus not of those who did not have a BRCA mutation. Although there probably is something more to the story and more work to be done here, because if you look at the 12-month progression-free survival there, those who had that BRCA-like signature in the tumor uh, were doing a little better than the other patients. Um, I'm sorry, I mentioned this already. This is they tried to refine the signature, but unfortunately, so far, this is still a work in progress. Um, but the other thing they did in the Ariel 2 study that is interesting is look at other genes, these other pathway genes that I mentioned at the beginning, and to see whether they, or not they might be associated with an um, increased likelihood of response to PARP inhibitor. And you know, the one that's probably most interesting here is RAD51C, where mo although these numbers are very small, and as I showed you, the proportion of patients who have one of these mutations in their genes is relatively low. Um, but um, the patients who did have this RAD51C inherited mutation uh, seem to benefit from Rucaparib. So that's an interesting place that we'll be watching further as well. And then switching gears a little from the treatment setting, so we have Olaparib and Rucaparib approved for treatment of ovarian cancer. What about maintenance? And so these are people who have had a response to platinum-based therapy for platinum-sensitive recurrent disease. And our first approval was this year with Nova Neraparib. Um, and this study was also trying to um, define populations of patients who may be more likely to benefit from ovarian cancer who do not have a BRCA mutation. Um, and um, this is a good patient population. Again, I'm just going to skip on through because we're running out of time. But the bottom line is patients who have a BRCA mutation have a significant benefit from neraparib. So this is a placebo-controlled trial because it's the maintenance rather than treatment setting and um, a significant benefit from neraparib. For patients who do not have a BRCA mutation, there's still a significant benefit from neraparib, but it's smaller. And this is a little bit of a muddy water because it included tumor BRCA mutations, which we know now are more likely to benefit from PARP inhibitors. And you can see these numbers here. Um, the patients who had a tumor BRCA mutation had a similar benefit from neraparib as those who had a, an inherited BRCA mutation. Um, and then when they looked at this, again, a biomarker that they were looking at, this is a different type of biomarker test that was used in the Ariel study. This is the Myriad My Choice assay. Um, but it was also not able to separate out. There was benefit seen in all patients versus placebo, um, but it, this question of whether or not we could truly select the patients who are most likely to benefit um, did not pan out in this setting either. Again, more work to be done. 
Uh, again, patients do relatively well. The difference with this drug, Nirapirib, is you get thrombocytopenia, which is low platelets, um, and this is a little more problematic than with either Olaparib or Rucaparib. Interestingly, they just presented quality of life data this week at ESMO, which is the big European cancer conference. Um, what they showed from these patient reported outcomes that the quality of life was the same um, if you were on Nirapirib or placebo. So this was very reassuring. So that was our third PARP inhibitor approval. And then more recently, the FDA approved Olaparib um, is in the maintenance setting. And Olaparib, I should have mentioned, the original approval was um, with many pills, but they changed the formulation along the way. And the maintenance approval is with a more uh, user-friendly version where patients don't have to swallow so many pills. Um, and this was just earlier this year, again, based on two clinical trials. Um, the first one is in a, a small population. Um, again, like the original Olaparib study about treatment, these patients had had more prior therapies, and um, this trial was more generous about allowing patients who weren't in such good shape uh, in comparison to the NOVA trial. Um, and so the um, progression-free survival is not quite as robust as in the NOVA study, but still very much improved over placebo. And then they retrospectively went back and looked at BRCA mutations. This study is actually an older study to the NOVA trial. Um, and they did show, again, that if you have a BRCA mutation, unsurprisingly, you were more likely to benefit. Um, and then more recently, this data is from February this year, which is ultimately in combination with that other trial that left, led to this FDA approval um, in patients who had a BRCA mutation, Olaparib maintenance. Um, this is more like the NOVA population, so in better shape. Um, and again, these are similar results to the NOVA maintenance data, where you get a great benefit from a PARP inhibitor if you have a BRCA mutation in the maintenance setting. Um, and then very briefly, just to hit upon Ariel 3, which is Rucaparib, the third drug being, um, which has presented data in the maintenance setting. Um, and a little bit of a complicated trial because, again, like the Ariel 2 study that I showed you, they were trying to define populations of patients that might be more likely to benefit who do not have a BRCA mutation. And they use this new cutoff for their signature. Um, and um, I'm just going to skip on through the patient population, but the bottom line is that all patients had benefit from Rucaparib, um, and as expected, those who had a BRCA mutation had the greatest benefit, but all patients had benefit, and when they tried to separate out, as I mentioned earlier, they were, they were not able to separate out by their signature which patients were more likely to benefit if they did not have a BRCA mutation. Uh, and again, reasonably well tolerated, as you would expect. I thought this was a nice slide. The discussant at ESMO put this together. So he was presenting this Rucaparib and the Nirapirib quality of life data in the maintenance setting. And he just compared these maintenance PARP inhibitor drugs in terms of the toxicity from a patient's perspective. This, of course, is a very, if you have somewhat equally effective drugs, as far as we can tell, then, of course, um, toxicity is a key driver of the choice you may make. Um, and they're relatively similar, except that Nirapirib, as I said, has more um, platelet issues, and liver toxicity is more common, really, with the uh, Rucaparib and Nirapirib over, or, sorry, Rucaparib over Nirapirib and Olaparib. So this has been a really exciting time. We had their first approval in 2014, but then since December last year, we've had all arrests. Um, so we've Olaparib for treatment, Rucaparib for treatment, Nirap, so both of those as defined by BRCA status, um, and then Nirapirib and Olaparib in the maintenance setting for all patients. Um, and then, of course, it's watch this space in terms of Rucaparib, whether or not it'll get a maintenance approval, hopefully soon. And of course, we have many ongoing studies, and there are many questions here. We have made phenomenal progress, and we're very excited about everything that has happened. Mm -hmm. However, we still have many questions. Um, what, what way to sequence or time these drugs in comparison to other available drugs? Should we be using them? We have studies looking at upfront PARP inhibitors. Um, and really, there are likely to be patients, despite all we've done so far, who are getting minimal benefit from these therapies. And if we could truly select out those who are more versus less likely to benefit, well, then um, we would offer other opportunities to those patients. Um, and that's something that we still have to work on. So a lot done and a lot more to do. Thank you.